Indira Gandhi National Open University presents a program in history entitled Mauritius. Course code EHI 05, Block 3. This program will highlight the theme of British expansion beyond the Indian frontiers. Taking Mauritius as a case study, it explains how the British used human resources of India as a base for consolidating their empire in Mauritius. Listen to the program entitled Mauritius. By the beginning of the 19th century, the transition from mercantile to industrial capitalism was in process. This meant the British economy was moving from being trade-based to modern industry-based. On the world scene, the British and the French had emerged as major players. Both were competing for goods and markets in various parts of the world. The British were, in this process, emerging more powerful than the French. The reason for British dominance was mainly due to the professional management of their business and their superior naval power. They had virtually consolidated their hold on the Indian subcontinent. Now, using India as a base, they were expanding beyond the Indian frontiers. The frontiers of the Indian Ocean were an important theatre of war between the French and the British. In the Indian Ocean, the island of Mauritius was a strategic point. Far from the eastern coast of South Africa, the island of Mauritius lies 800 kilometres east of Madagascar in the Indian Ocean. It was an important port of trade. Till 1810, it was under the control of the French. French ships used to attack the British ships on this route by using Mauritius as a base. The British now used Madras in India as a base to displace the French power from Mauritius. In 1810, the British captured Mauritius and upon restoration of peace in 1814, it was placed under the British crown by the Treaty of Paris. The economy of Mauritius was mainly based on sugar plantation. These sugar plantations were still in the hands of the French aristocracy on the island. The labourers working on their fields were mainly African slaves, brought earlier by the French. The French legal and judicial system was still in use in Mauritius. The task of the British was now to form their own civil administration in Mauritius, to rule over the colony. In the meantime, back home in England, slavery abolition movements were gaining ground. Anti-slavery societies had come up all over England. pressure of industrial capitalism also meant that the British needed to create wage labour rather than slave labour. It was thus that Slavery Abolition Acts were passed by the British government in 1820. But the passing of anti-slavery laws did not mean that slavery could immediately be abolished. In Mauritius, the French aristocracy had a vested interest in keeping the slave labour as it tended to keep the system intact. It was thus that when the British government sent its emissary, named Germany, to Mauritius to implement slave abolition laws, 
the French planters organized street demonstrations against him. The resistance against Mr. Jeremy was so much that he was not allowed to get off his ship. Thus, it became clear to the British in Mauritius that the base of the French aristocracy and its judicial system lay in the perpetuation of slavery. To build their own base, they had to continue the struggle to abolish slavery. But the existing French aristocracy in Mauritius was so strong that the British now decided to buy the slaves from the French planters and set them free. This step was taken in 1832. Now the sugar plantations needed new labour. For this purpose, the British used their base in India to recruit fresh labour. Initially, the British brought Indian convicts as labour. But, by the 1830s, this import had to be discontinued under strong abolitionist pressure. It was then that the British governments of India and Mauritius set up recruiting agencies all over India. of engagement through contract. Each labourer was required to sign a contract for serving on the plantation for five years. He was also promised a passage back to India after the completion of the contract. Secondly, both in India and in Mauritius, detailed registers with information about each labourer were kept. This included his name, caste, place of origin, and body marks. Information about their marital status was also kept in marriage registers. Number 352795. Name? Chattu Sarkar. Father? Davi. Age? 25 years. 25. Caste? Kunvi. Village? Lashmi Kaur. Pargana? Andhrapur. Zilla, Banaras, Occupation, Majduri Hajur, Labor, Identification Mark, Pitwa Pe Nisanwa, Tear on the Belly, Estate, Engaged to Chauvin and Company, Mon Tresor, Dated 7-7-1872. The first batch of 34 laborers called Hill Coolies, were mostly recruited from the hilly area of Chota Nagpur. Some of the names of the first batch were Surup Sardar, Sabram Mate, Bhutu, Champa, Bundu, Chota Bundu. A British official comments, 36 men calling themselves by the names herein and being of the caste of Tangars and Puna Coolies, appeared before me this day, 9th September, 1834, and after having heard the conditions above, recited thoroughly, explained to them by myself and Mr. Fury the clerk, expressed their agreement in all the conditions specified and signed their marks. D. McFarlane, Chief Magistrate of Calcutta. Over the years of emigration, the coolies had come mainly from the famine tracts of Orissa, Bihar, Maharashtra and the Madras Presidency. Migration for employment was a habit with them. So they regarded this as a major opportunity. We have reports that the earlier batches of the coolies sailed to Mauritius in a happy and optimistic frame of mind.
the correspondence maintained by the British on the conditions on the ship and plantations indicated otherwise. Reports of terrible sanitary conditions and disease were revealed by the diary of Captain E. Swinton on the ship named Salset, which sailed from Calcutta on the 17th of March, 1858. 29th April, 1858. Sick all better. Got the launch boat cleaned to convert it into a hospital for the sick. The smell below being so dreadful, though everything done to prevent it. I regret it was not done on leaving Calcutta, as I believe many would have been saved. Each time I go below, the smell makes me sick. I truly pity, but the cold weather likely to come on deterred me from turning the boat into a hospital. Nineteenth June. A man dying from diarrhea. Another dead from diarrhea, and several won't confess this illness till too far gone. some native games and war dances. 30th June. Mustered the coolies and find only 108 men, 61 women and 30 children under 10 years of age, two infants and two interpreters left of the 324 we sailed with from Calcutta. 2nd July, a girl of 15 died. Dr. Anderson of the Trinidad Emigration Agency and Customs House Officer and Harbour Master came on board. Thought the coolies a miserable set and the mortality dreadful. 15 to 20 years, the British concentrated on enacting laws for managing disputes between the planters and labor. In this period, the labor was mainly single and without a family. Here, the British had to make laws which would keep the labor confined to the plantations. On the plantation, the historian Hugh Tinker pointed out in his book, A New System of Slavery, the older practices of treating the labor continued. Hey, 
बीमार हो गया है पानी पानी चिल्ला रहा था बेहोश है मुझे पता नहीं इसे क्या हो गया साहेब तो होशियारी करता है पानी चाहिए ये लो सरबत Here we present a testimony of Sardar Chutu in front of District Magistrate Grant Port, Mauritius. Mr. Chutu, what's your complaint? Sarkar, I, I am a Sardar of Mon Tresor Estate. Since, since the manager came on the estate 10 months ago, whenever we came late for the roll call, he beat us. And we are called very early to work. At, at 4 o'clock we have to go to the fields. I did not go this morning because, because the manager beat me. Since last 10 months we have been working for 18 hours, Sarkar, 18 hours a day. I, I did not complain because of fear. In the morning, in the morning when we reached the fields, it is dark and, and if the tasks are not finished, we are marked absent and, and our wages are cut, Sarkar, our wages are cut. The indentured labor was at the whim and mercy of the planter and those in charge. On the plantation, arbitrary cutting of wages was also in practice. The Agent General Immigrations Report, 1871. When the rainy season sets in, the Indian's heaviest trials commence when he makes his first essay in weeding in high canes. The work is hard and monotonous, may almost be called solitary. He loses heart, makes a task in double the time in which an experienced hand would do returns at a late hour, cold, wet and fatigued. To renew the struggle on the morrow with decreased vitality. Till the end of the first year, it is found that his work has not paid for his rations. An immigrant embarks on the second year of apprenticeship saddled with a considerable debt. The British government now made two kinds of laws. One, anti-vagrancy laws. That is, if the labourer ran away, he was described as a vagrant and was punished for it. Secondly, the British made laws to prevent violation of the contract the Labour had signed. Thus, these laws gave power to the British over both the planter and the Labour. However, as the laws grew more tough, both the Labour and plantation owners suffered. The sugar economy by the 1860s and 70s was undergoing a crisis. The burden of the crisis was felt more by the labourer, as his wages were cut and working and living conditions became miserable. The situation became so alarming that the British government set up a Royal Commission of Inquiry in 1874 to look into the conditions of labour. It is in this context that the British government started encouraging family-based immigration to Mauritius. The advantage of family migrations, the British felt, was that they could develop a sustained labour force in Mauritius. Secondly, the British felt that the law and order problems created by vagrancy of men which led to a sharp increase in the number of coolie wife murders, 
could be stopped by creating a family-based environment. Therefore, the British passed an ordinance, number three in 1856, for punishing those persons who enticed away the lawful wives of Indian emigrants. Secondly, a law was passed in 1854, legalizing marriages made in India in Mauritius. Thirdly, the ordinance promised one pound bonus for every woman relative who accompanied a returnee immigrant back to Mauritius. So, now the British government carefully maintained records of the family life of the emigrant labor. And this record again gave them a source of control for regulating emigrant labor in Mauritius. The British now used these formidable legislations to demonstrate to the planters as to who was the boss. Indeed, the number of Indian indentured laborers had now swelled up and they constituted 62% of the population by the 1880s. In the question of giving voting rights to the Indians, the British government now had a pressure point at its command vis-à-vis -vis the French. Secondly, the Indians by virtue of their savings, were able to buy off pieces of estates from planters. This phenomenon, called Morselmo, largely resulted when the sugar economy faced crisis and the planters now could not revert back to slave or forced labor. The emergence of this property class of Indians again acted as a pressure point against the French planters and, for the time being, a support base for the British. It was thus that the British were able to expand and consolidate in Mauritius. Through a systematic recruitment policy of Indian indentured labor, the British supplied the crucial labor force to the colony. Thereafter, the British devised laws to control and coordinate the indentured labor. For this, they maintained systematic records. The phenomenon of Morselmo, whereby the Indians bought off pieces of land and economically improved themselves, gave the British further support vis-à-vis -vis the French aristocracy. In this process, the British dominance was reinforced.